the goal isn't to have the most money. The goal is to be happy, right? The goal is to be happy. So, uh, and there's a pretty weak correlation between having money and being happy. So if, if getting to a level of income or wealth is going to put you in a position where you're going to have to do a lot of things that are going to make you unhappy or stress you out, then you should probably rethink doing it. So remember, the two sources of financial stress are debt and risk. And I'm not saying you should completely avoid debt or risk because debt or risk are inevitable, but you should try to minimize it and manage it as much as possible. Hi, everyone. I hope you're enjoying the Festival of Learning so far. That was a great conversation we just heard from Rosie and Andreas on the business cycle. Right now, we're going to bring it a little closer to home and talk personal finance with Jared Dillian, editor of the Daily Dirt Nap. We'll be taking questions, so make sure you go ahead and drop them in the Discord chat. Hey, Jared, how are you? Hey, what's up? Uh, not too much. I, a lot of people are excited for this. Well, I shouldn't say that. There's a lot going on. A lot of it's stressful. And a lot of people are like, ah, what does this mean for, you know, my personal finance? I think a lot of people are really worried about both protecting and growing their wealth. But right now, it seems like the emphasis on sort of protecting their wealth. Um, before we jump into the questions, though, you know, I know you talk to people about this a lot. Um, what is a common mistake you think a lot of us make when it comes to dealing with our own finances? Well, I, I think the most common mistake that people make is trying to make the number as big as possible. You know, trying to make the number in the bank account as big as possible. And the way I approach personal finance is that personal finance should be about minimizing your financial stress, okay? Because we all have stress in our lives. We have different kinds of stress. We have work stress. We have family stress. We have mental health stress. There's addictions, there's all types of sources of stress. But the thing about financial stress is that it's totally avoidable. If you structure your life in such a way, it can be totally avoidable and you don't have to worry about money at all. And that's really where you want to get to. You want to get to a place where you're not worrying about money. And beyond that, you want to get to a place where you don't even think about money, where you know, we, we, most of us here on Real Vision are in a profession where we have to think about money 24 seven. You know, we're staring at the Bloomberg screen, we're doing stock recommendations or whatever. Um, but outside of my job, I don't really spend a great deal of time thinking about the $7.50 I just paid for a bagel, right? Like, I don't think about that. But a lot of people do spend a lot of time thinking about stuff like that. So like I said, if you structure your life in such a way, you won't have to worry about money ever again. All right, we got to dig into that because I feel like, I don't know, jump in the, ch the chat and let me know, but I feel like finances is probably ranked really high on the things that people stress about. People would love to not be able to feel that way. How do you get to the point? If you, What do you mean when you say if you structure your life that way? How do you get to the point where you can feel like that. You can feel like, even if I'm thinking about it, this is not a major source of stress. I mean, I think this keeps people up at night. Well, what I mean by that is the conventional wisdom in personal finance is that it's a million small things that determine how much money you have. Like, for example, I mean, the one that people talk about all the time is this Susie Orman thing about giving up coffee, right? So if you don't buy coffee at Starbucks, if you make it at home, then you're saving $4 a day times 225 days a year. That's $900 a year for 40 years. So you're saving $36,000, which if you invested at a 12% return, you would have like $150,000. So if you just gave up coffee, then you could have a comfortable retirement. But the problem with that thinking is is that people enjoy coffee, right? Yeah. It's, it's, it's a luxury. It's a small daily luxury. And if you have this program that tells you you have to give up small luxuries every day for decades in order to achieve this goal, you can't maintain it. You can't maintain it. So actually, that is a source of stress because people are constantly thinking about like, 
oh my god, the, uh, my date just ordered two appetizers for dinner, and I have to pay for that, and and immediately you feel stress. But yeah. but my take is the small stuff does not matter, right? Whether you, whether you make coffee at home doesn't make any difference at all. It's it's really it's three big things and maybe four. It's number one. It's how big of a house do you buy? Number two, what kind of a car do you get? Number three, how do you pay for college? And 3A is like, how many kids do you have? And that's that's really it. It's if you get those three things right, then you will never have to worry about money. You can You can buy coffee at Starbucks. It's not a big deal. Let me put this in perspective. Let's say you bought a $500,000 house instead of a $400,000 house, right? So you're borrowing an extra $100,000. If you borrow an extra $100,000, the interest on that is equal to 110 years of coffee. <laughs> if you buy an $80,000 car instead of a $40,000 car, the interest on that is equal to 30 years of coffee. So the coffee does not fucking matter at all. Like the little stuff does not matter. It's three big things. If you get the three big things right, then you're fine. Hey, sorry to interrupt again. Uh, it's Raul here from Real Vision. I'd love for you to subscribe to the channel, get the notifications. We have so many incredible conversations with so many amazing people. It will really help you in your financial journey and your journey to understand just what the hell's going on in this world. Anyway, click subscribe, get the notifications and enjoy. Uh, that's that's some great perspective. I think that, that Daniel's saying, "Wow, people. Some people drink a lot of coffee, but uh, it is the example that in, she talks about shoes too. If you've ever seen those programs, and they kind of drive me crazy. And I think you touched on really something really important because it kind of creates this shame cycle. Like you're stressed and shaming yourself for taking these steps that everyone tells you can get that can get you where you want to go, but there's so much misery in the process." that you do kind of lose sight of, of some of these bigger issues, I think. Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of guilt around it. Like you buy yeah. something and then you feel guilt. And, you know, the the personal finance industry, you know, so Dave Ramsey and people like him is kind of set up against this mythological person that has a 580 credit score and they've maxed out all their credit cards and they're drowning in debt and they have a spending addiction and they buy $700 shoes, and they buy expensive cars. Like, that person is mythological. Like, really, the vast majority of people are responsible with their money. So there's actually two extremes, okay? And one extreme, which, the, which Dave Ramsey likes to talk about, is the person who spends too much, right? But there's another extreme of people who actually spend too little, and if you've ever met somebody in your life who is a cheap bastard, right? Like, sh sure, they're 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 never going to go bankrupt, right? They're never they're never going to have debt problems, but they have other problems. They have relationship problems, right? Because they're the type of person that says, "Well, I'm not paying for you to go to college," and then the kids have resentments, and you know they end up in therapy later. So people. People who spend too little also cause a lot of damage. So the goal isn't to be at either end of the spectrum. The goal is to be in the middle and have balance and basically, you know, just choose the middle path. Yeah. No, I think that's great. Some Somebody, by the way, I'm, I'm laughing as I read this because uh... – Someone said, amen, brother, ordering a gourmet pizza right now. <laughs> and I feel you on that. But it, and, and to be clear, you're not saying like YOLO, go for it, spend like crazy. You're just saying that there's a moderation somewhere in the middle there. And you just prioritize some of the really concentrate on prioritizing and making decisions on some of the really big issues. And then you can worry about the other stuff. And, and that's less of a less of a concern if you get some of those big things right. For yeah, you, absolutely. for yeah. you too, right? Everyone's answer is going to be different on some of those things you raised. Yeah, I mean, you know, let me put it this way. For me personally, two years ago, I had a house that was paid for. I had no mortgage. And I said, I want to build a house, right? So we're building this humongous house and it's, th th this is self-inflicted. It's causing me stress. You know, I had to come, come up with a huge amount of money for the down payment. The payment on the mortgage is going to be huge. 
you know, there's two sources of financial stress. There's only two. And one of them is debt and the other is risk. Two sources of financial stress. A lot mm. of people think that a source of financial stress is not having enough money. It's totally false. There are people who are dead broke who are perfectly happy. They're, they're living within their means. They don't have any debt. They don't have any money in the stock market. And they're happy. They don't, they don't worry about money at all. And there are people who are billionaires. Elon Musk, richest person in the world. What does he do? He buys Twitter with a bunch of debt. And then the stock goes down 75%. And he's feeling financial stress. So there, there's, you know, it, 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 there's no correlation to how much money you have. It's a function of how much debt you have and a, a function of how much risk you have in the capital markets. Those are the only two sources of financial stress. That's, that's so interesting. That's a great way to think about it. And, and how much risk and whether that, that your level of risk is comfortable for you. Right. I think that's really important. Some people are comfortable having a higher level of risk, but for some people, they think it's what they need to do. And it totally stresses them out. It totally stresses them out. Well, I think, you know, I think there's been some bad advice given in the last 10 years. You know, we've seen the rise of index funds and mm -hmm. people who are index funds promoters. And they say, look, just put all your money in spies or the Vanguard total market return fund or whatever. Just like dollar cost average it and keep buying and hang on forever. But the problem with an index fund is that when you invest in an index, not only do you get the returns of the index, which are terrific, you also get the volatility of the index. And the S&P 500 is super volatile. You know, I mean, it can go down 50% in a year. So yeah. what you're doing is like, it, 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 it kind of blows my mind because there are very few people that can sustain a drawdown of more than 20 or 30% and keep dollar cost averaging and keep buying. So the solution to this is to diversify across asset classes and construct a portfolio that has minimum volatility. So we got a couple of great questions on it. First of all, Enlightened Liquidity Pool says, please tell Jared you're so money and don't even know it. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Um, but we've got a little bit of pushback coming from uh, someone else. I'm not I'm, some of these I can't pronounce the handles, but I, I love all these comments. Uh, the vast majority of people are responsible with their money question mark. I don't believe that's accurate. Uh, this is Vash FTW GG. Um, I don't know that you're saying they're responsible with their money. I just think you're saying that the picture that they're either totally reckless or or um or really cheap like those two extremes are not probably accurate i don't know do, do, are you, do you think people are more responsible than we're led to believe i think that 30 percent of people spend too much i think about 55 percent of people spend too little and there's only about 15 percent of people who what i would say have a healthy relationship with money I mean, that's the goal is that you want to have a healthy relationship with money and having a healthy relationship with money means that you don't think about it. Like you go to lunch, you pay for it and you're not doing this mental masturbation about, okay, you know, I spent $2 more on lunch, which means I have to spend $2 less over here. You just don't think about it. Like that's the place where you want to get to. Yeah. I think also, um, what is responsible with money mean? means different things to different people, doesn't it? I mean, I would argue, you know, my definition of what's responsible with mo for, with money or about money, with their money, might be different than someone else's. Um, Daniel asking, what do you think about investing in yourself? Does that make your sort of big number list of things if you get that right? So one of the things that I like to talk about is what I call the revenue side, right? You can, you can, you're, a person is a business. An individual is just like a business. You take in revenues, you have expenses. And a lot of people say, well, uh, I need to come up with some money, so I'm going to cut expenses. So let's say, you know, me in 1999. 1999, I was in the Coast Guard. I was making $45,000 a year, right? There's a year, right? So if I squeezed and squeezed and squeezed, I could have come up with an extra $3,000 a year. But what did I do instead? I went to business school. I got my MBA. I got a job at Lehman Brothers. 
And a few years later, I was making 800,000 a year. So I invested in myself. But really what's that, what that's about is focusing on the top line rather than the bottom line. Like if, if not having enough money is a problem, the obvious solution to this is to go out and make more money. That's the obvious solution. But people, people kind of view this as a pie, a finite amount of money, and they try to slice it into smaller and smaller pieces. But instead, that's no fun. It's absolutely no fun. Cutting expenses sucks. You know, you're cutting out these luxuries. You're miserable. You're going through this austerity. Instead of doing that, then focus on the top line. Focus on how to bring in more money. That, yeah, that's really interesting. And it sort of challenges us all to be a little bit more entrepreneurial or, you know, think about what you can do, what whether it's in your own job or kind of expanding maybe the types of things you could do, which with technology is a little bit more... Um, we're more able to. Fascinating conversation, by the way, with somebody who's at the Academy last night who talked about really um, ch- changing his mindset. He did the same thing, invested in himself, lives in uh, Geneva, went to the U.S., did a course, and met so many people who were so entrepreneurial and disruptive. It's sort of really changed his mindset, and he's launched his own company. You know, that's not maybe possible for everybody, but it kind of speaks to that mindset mindset shift when you when you focused on revenue. <laughs> Mingus Mill saying, Jared, when are you going to create a music bump for RV? Yes, please. <laughs> Thank you, Mingus. We were sort of just talking about that a moment ago, having Jared DJ one of our events, but this is an even better idea or an equally good idea. We will we will bring that to, to the top. Um, Whiskey Mike saying, good point about avoiding extreme ends of the spectrum. But Hub has an interesting point. A high interest rate on a house or car loan does matter. So sometimes you've got to deal with the circumstances you find yourself in, right? If you're sort of thinking about, okay, I think this size home is going to enable me to be less stressed. Same thing with the car. Suddenly you're out there in the market and now, now the prices on everything go up. How can you kind of factor that in Jared. well you know it's funny because i i had a radio show on personal finance from 2019 to 2021 and it was in a very low interest rate environment you know what i mean so a lot of my thinking around this was developed when interest rates were very low if interest rates are higher it just means you can afford less i mean that's the reality of it um you know, it, it, your, your car payment should not be bigger than your house payment, which is true of a lot of people in South Carolina, right? <laughs> yeah. You might be a redneck if your car payment is bigger than your house payment. <laughs> like, it's absolutely true. Um, no, I mean, like, it, it's – if you, you, can't get a, you can't get a car loan with double-digit interest, interest rates. I, I suspect that not many people – listening fall into this category but you know here in the south you have a lot of what's called subprime auto dealers it's not a dealership in the traditional sense it's a parking lot with about 30 cars on it and there's a sign out front that says no credit no problem and they will put you in a car but the interest rate is going to be like 20 or 30 percent and you'll buy a three thousand dollar car and you'll end up spending eight thousand dollars in interest and that is that is absolutely not the way to do it. So, you know, in the in the instance of buying a car, if you're not getting an interest rate of four or five, six percent, then pay cash for the car. Remember, one of the sources of financial stress is debt, right? Mm-hmm. And one of the reasons that debt is a source of financial stress is because you have this payment that you have to make every month. And the bigger the payment is, the more you worry about it. Yeah. This is a really this is a really good question and and it's a deep one. So it, you know if you want to just think on it and come back to it later in the show, we'll do that because I think that you know when we say something like pay cash, that's fine if you have cash and if you've saved up, and especially when we're talking about a car because here in the states you need a car to get to work, right? So it's this terrible. That's why a lot of people are worried about the reset in a higher rate environment for people who have to go out and get that car because it's critical. Um, uh, GJ George asking, how might the concept of unfuck your finances differ for individuals from marginalized communities who face systemic financial disadvantages and discrimination and what additional resources and support might be necessary 
to help them achieve financial empowerment and security? Um, it's a great question, GJ, um, but it's a big one. I don't know. You want to take a whack at it, Jared? Or you want to think on it a little bit? No, I can take a whack at it. I mean, look, like, you know, I don't come from a marginalized community, but I didn't grow up with a lot of money. I grew up, you know, kind of lower middle class. But I came from a family that really just hated the use of debt. Like, was, I mean, they were cheap fucks. I came from a family with cheap fucks. Like, they just, you know, they just were cheap, cheap, cheap. And, like, those values that I got as a teenager, I took into adulthood. So, really, you know, I'm sort of a function of my upbringing. If, if you live in a community where there's not there's not any cultural knowledge about finance, I mean, the, see, here's the problem, and a lot of this is a lot of this has to do with education. What you're seeing now is a push for classes on personal finance in high schools across the country. Yeah. I think six states have now passed legislation that have been enacted personal finance curriculums, and I think this is absolutely a good thing because. If kids aren't learning about this at home, then they have to learn about it somewhere. So ultimately, I think education on this stuff is really the best solution to the problem. Yeah, I agree. And, and obviously, that's why we launched Real Vision, because no matter what your background, if you don't have access to these type of ideas, that's why we have the Academy. Raul and Andres just gave a master class last night to try to dig in and understand and kind of break down the stigma about getting your hands dirty in this stuff because you do need it. And and the the school my kids go to, it is a requirement. You can't graduate without taking personal finance. Um, and they were moaning about doing it, even though we try to talk to them about it. And, and they actually learned a lot and they admitted it. Um, it's a fantastic thing to do. I also think that um, for anybody who listened to our podcast with Peter Diamandis, uh, He's a serial entrepreneur. It had nothing to do with personal finance, but he always says if there's a problem, if you have a societal problem, you also have potentially the biggest business opportunity to solve. Um, and so somewhere someone's talking about fractionalized art. I know there are things like fractionalized ownership of things, of sharing. You know, there are there hopefully um, people are I would encourage everyone to take a think about that if you're someone who's been affected by that. By the way, um, we also have people responding saying they are also not in a marginalized community, which clearly is a lot harder. But um, echoing your sentiment, Jared, about considering how to make money, raise capital, anything else but take on debt to accomplish goals so that you don't sort of have that burden um, and we won't even get into student loans because I think a lot of people are, you know, that that that's something that comes to mind in that same in that same frame. Um, let's see what else we have here. Uh, a lot of people asking about um, what to do in this environment. Uh, what do you recommend for residual income that keeps pace with inflation and pays you to live? So I'm not really a big passive income guy, okay? Let's take a look for a second. The two most popular finance books of all time, two out of the three, okay? Uh, on one hand, you had The Millionaire Next Door, okay, which I can't remember who wrote it. Um, can't, the name escapes me right now, which is about being a cheap fuck. Uh, the other one is uh, by Robert Kiyosaki, Rich Dad, Poor Dad, right? Now, the first half of that book is truly amazing, like because it really gets into your attitudes towards money. And in order to do this, you first have to have the right attitude. And I thought the first half of that book was brilliant. But then he gets into this whole thing about passive income, about buying houses, buying laundromats, buying dental practices and levering up in order to generate this passive income. And you know, again, getting back to my philosophy that, you know, the source of all financial stress is debt and risk. I mean, yes, you know, a lot of people do that successfully, but it is also a huge amount of stress. And the, there is a likelihood, however remote, that all the houses you own that you're renting out are going to go pear shaped at the same time. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So it exposes you to financial ruin. So one of the things you try to avoid is the risk of ruin. So I've never been a passive income guy at all. And a lot of times the stuff that looks like passive income actually is active income because there's sort of this mythology around like, 
okay, I'm going to buy a couple of houses and I'm going to rent them out and I'm going to collect checks and I'm going to make $100,000 a year while sitting on my ass. But it's it's not that easy because you have people setting off fire extinguishers, you have people clogging toilets, you have parties, and you end up spending a lot of time on these properties and it ends up being a lot more work than you initially thought. So I think the whole passive income thing is a complete illusion. Like I said, some people can do it, some people do it well, but it causes a lot of stress. Hmm. Um, I just want I just want to respond to this because Jared and I have talked a lot. Um, and someone's saying you got lucky, 800k a year for an MBA that doesn't exist for 90% of people. That may be true, but I'm not sure luck has anything to do with it. Uh, if I remember correctly, Jared, you were pretty feisty in terms of getting yourself um, a door, a, a foot in the door of Wall Street and sort of yeah. pursuing that dream, right? Oh, yeah, yeah. I mean, I don't want to I don't want to get into that whole story, but um, well, you know, they, can went... take, they can take my word for it. Um, I wouldn't I wouldn't put I wouldn't put luck in that sentence. Yeah. Um, which, by the way, is true of many of the people that we have on. They often say themselves they're lucky. But when I talk to them for my life of four trades, for those of you who've listened to the podcast, I, I think a few of them have said it different ways, but it's a lot of work to put yourself in the right position if luck happens to come your way or an opportunity has to come your way. But there's an awful lot of hard work that gets you ready for that moment. You know, yeah, so the way I'm not saying luck doesn't have anything to do with it. Sometimes, you know, something something happens and there's an, a, a door opens, but you have to be ready. Otherwise, it doesn't mean anything. Yeah, the, well, the way I like to call it is you, you have to be positively exposed to luck. Yes. Right. You, so you have, to, you have to put yourself in a position where good luck can happen to you. You know what I mean? Which, you know, is another way of saying if, if I stayed in my apartment in California and just wished for a job on Wall Street, I never would have got one. You know what I mean? But I was buying plane tickets and flying to New York every couple of months to do informational interviews and hustling, you know, trying to hustle a job on Wall Street. And that's what happened. So, yeah, yeah, I like that. But I, I, I think and, I, and I'm only mentioning it's a great point to make. A lot of us think about this and worry it. And I'm, and I'm, I'm not criticizing the question, because, but I do think there is a sense that things happen to us when it comes to money. You know, like we don't have any agency. We all feel like that. I feel like that sometimes. But I think I, I like the way you're framing it, Jared, because it puts some control back in our hands, which I think is really important. So we have a question. Uh, what is the best safe haven if we go into another bank, major bank crisis? This speaks to that we get a lot of questions. You and I get a lot of questions on the daily briefing. How do I protect myself? Like, how do I, how do I protect what I've managed to achieve so far? So this person's asking gold, Bitcoin, the bond market, that could also collapse, question mark. What are you thinking about in terms of safe havens for people? Well, the way I structure my financial affairs is I have something approaching a portfolio that is 20% stocks, 20% bonds, 20% gold, 20% cash, and 20% real estate. And the cool thing about this portfolio is that over the last 50 years, the biggest drawdown it ever took was last year it was down 12%. The biggest drawdown before that was in 2008, it was down 9%. So you have this portfolio that over the course of 50 years, the worst year ever was 12%. It has an average return of 8.4% with half the volatility of an 80-20 portfolio. So the question was, you know, where do you hide in case of a banking crisis or something like that? Do I hide in gold? Do I hide? It doesn't have anything to do with like having a place to hide. It has to be, it has to do with being appropriately diversified across asset classes, right? To give you that minimum volatility. So Yeah. And I'm gonna I'm gonna emphasize uh appropriately diversified. We've done a couple of segments for for those of you who are subscribers of R V. Um Diego Perea is one of them talks about false diversification. So you think you're diversified because you have different assets, but all those assets have potentially the same reaction if something happens. So you have to be well, careful about that's, that. That's 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 actually that's a great point because um, you know, that was the argument for index funds 25 years ago. You say, okay, like I'm going to buy an index fund. Uh, I, I, I'm buying 500 stocks at the same time. So I'm diversified. Yes. Yeah. But you know, in 1999, 
Index funds were 2% of assets under management. Today, they're 56% of assets under management. So if 56% of people have the same 500 stocks that you do, then you are no longer diversified. Yeah. Yeah. It's it's so important. We talk about it a lot right now because there's a lot of conversation about this. And rightly so. You were sort of all, a lot of people were sold that idea, you know, that that you would be. But we're, we're seeing the pain of that right now. By the way, we were just talking about, Jared was just talking about his portfolio. Clearly, everyone has different, you know, age issues, requirements, like you only you can know what works for you. So Jared's just talking about how he approaches it. Um, th that should not be considered a recommendation for you to necessarily go do that, right? There's risk in everything. Everyone's situation is different. So just know that we're talking broadly. We're not we're not giving you investment advice. You, you need to take information and plug it into your own framework. That's what we say every time we do one of these things on Real Vision. And we'll be saying it through the whole festival of learning. Um, great, great question. Oh, uh, this, I, this, I feel this one. I really feel this one. How do we get to the point where we don't have to think about money? Even if I don't have to think about money for my day to day, I still think about trying to accumulate wealth to leave money for my kids. I would just tack on or pay for my kids to get to the point where they can get through college. I mean, this is a huge issue. So even if the day to day is okay, how do you grapple with that? Those future needs, Jared? Uh, I'm not really sure I understand the question. So basically, I think he's saying, how do I get to the point where I don't have to think about money? It's not that the day-to-day -day is hanging them up. It's kind of like growing a big enough nest egg oh, okay. for the future, you know, for future generations. Well, this is this is a one day at a time thing. That's really all it is. It's one day at a time, one week at a time, one month at a time. You know, uh, you know, I have some assets built up. Uh, it took 25 years, you know. Mm -hmm. um, I started investing in 1997. I got a couple of mutual funds. I started with like 3000 bucks and today it's many multiples of that. And it's just doing it, you know, week after week after week compounding. It just grows over time, you know? So it just, you just got to take a really long-term view and not focus on the day to day. Yeah. And not go, we've also in an environment where everyone's like, oh, you know, I 10 X this and I, you know, I got that home run that's going to solve all your problems. I think there's kind of an addiction to that right now. Yeah. So. Also, I think people who hit home runs then tend to lose it all. You know what I mean? Like we've seen a lot of examples in the last couple of years, Bitcoin being the biggest one where people, you know, on paper were worth tens of hundreds of millions of dollars and they never took profits and it just disappeared, you know? So you see that over and over again. And that's one of the things I like to think about too. Um, you know, when, when to exit an investment, you know, there comes a point where, you know, th there's a lot of this fear of missing out, like I'm going to sell and then it's going to keep going up. Like there just comes a point where you make enough money, like, and, and you've made enough money and it's fine. So that's, you know, that's, that's my guidance on that. Yeah, Wookie, well, great question though, because I think it I think it hit home for a lot of people. Uh, Deb's asking for millennials. We've been in the lowest interest rate environment for years. Now we're getting hit by inflation. What advice would you give to navigate this for the next three to five years? And should we get into owning a house? Yeah, I, you know, in terms of uh, owning a house, you know, even in a higher th this isn't a super high interest rate environment. First of all, you know, I mean, mortgage rates are about six six and a half percent. Uh, I bought my first house. Mortgage rates were seven and a quarter. Um, you know, obviously they went down a lot from there. But, you know, interest rates are not super high. And by the way, in an inflationary environment, like really the best asset class to own is real estate. And a lot of people are losing sight of that. They're like, oh my God, interest rates went up 400 basis points. The housing market's going to crash. No, like we're going to have inflation for a while and land and real estate and tangible assets are going to do really, really well. But the other thing about buying a house is, you know, the way we do it in the United States is a really good way because buying a house is a forced savings program. One of the best financial innovations of all time was the 30 year fixed rate mortgage because you have the savings program where you pay down this mortgage month after month after month, mm -hmm. and you're building equity in the house. And at the end of 30 years, you own the house, which is probably appreciated in value. And that's currency, right? So one of the things I see a lot in Myrtle Beach is very blue collar family in Brooklyn, okay? 
bought their house in Brooklyn in the 70s for like $70,000. They bought it when interest rates were 14, 15%. They refied it several times. They paid it down over 30 years. That house in Brooklyn is now worth a million dollars. They sell it for cash. They come down to Myrtle Beach. They pay $300,000 for a house and they live off the 700. Like, that's how you, and and by the way, these are people without retirement accounts. These are people without bank account. They have bank accounts, but they don't have savings. Like all they have is that equity in their house. That forced savings program built them the only wealth that they're ever going to have, and it turned out to be massive. Yeah, um, it's a great point. And and by the way, we're also seeing the benefit of having fixed uh, fixed rates. So many people. Uh, moved on, even more of them. Uh, the numbers always stagger me when we talk about it on the daily briefing. Moved into fixed rates, and so they're less. It's it's helping buffer some of the interest rate volatility we're seeing right now, and taking a big stress off people. Uh, this is a really interesting question. Wait, I lost it. Oh yeah, okay. Dallas, do you think that having fear of doing new things and paralysis analysis are obstacles to generate more money? If the answer is yes, then what do you do? What do you recommend to manage them? Good question. A fear of new doing new things and paralysis by analysis. Yeah, are they obstacles to generating more money? Or I'll put in your in in the language you're talking about today, Jared. Are they obstacles in terms of thinking about it through a revenue lens as opposed to expenses? Yeah. You know? Yeah, I mean, the the one thing it's funny, I never this is a really good topic. Um, my answer to it is pretty short. You know, I tend to have a bias to action. You know, I I mm. just, you know, if, if you remember that speech with uh, with the Joker in the Dark Knight, you know, the, there's the Joker and Harvey Dent is in bed, and the Joker's like, I just do things. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. I he, like, do I look <laughs> like somebody with a plan? You know, and really, like, there's a there's a lot of wisdom in that. You know what I mean? Yeah, just do shit. Just just try stuff out. Uh, you know, the consequences are, you know, generally not terrible. You know, if you fail, then that's a lesson. You have an expensive lesson and, you know, you learn something and you just you move or on. Or maybe not an expensive lesson. I, I, I think you just brought up a really, really important thing. And I think in that question was really the fear of failure. It wasn't really, it's fear of trying new things. Okay, but maybe really it, it's fear, fear of failure. And sometimes, especially when you're thinking about, something that may be entrepreneurial or maybe a side hustle that you're trying to do or something um, that, that it's, it's that fear of failure. If I tell everyone I'm doing it, it doesn't work out. Um, you know, where do I go from there? That's huge. It's really important. And it's something we all feel by the way. Um, someone just asked the name of the podcast where, where I interviewed Peter Diamandis. I'm going to, I'm going to perfect question because so much of what comes up, it's called my life in four trades. You can get it on our platform We've got some video versions, or you can find it wherever you get your podcast. One of the things that comes up time and time again in that, so they do two of their best trades, two of their worst trades, and Jared's done it with me. Uh, and it's in the in the worst trades, it's often learning from failure. And they, Jared included, everybody loved talking about their bad trades because it was the biggest learning they had. Um, and and in some ways, those mistakes that they made ultimately set them up for some of their best successes. So. That's a that's a tough one, but I think it's 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 well worth spending some time and getting comfortable with failure. We've sort of culturally beat it out of everyone. I talk about this with my kids all the time, um, but that's a great way to kind of leave lean into revenue is is to embrace that. Um, someone is asking uh, you. You mentioned oh, that that's a second. Let me see if I can find the first part of that. That we've got so many good questions. They're kind of flying by. Uh, if you are a long-term investor, why does monthly volatility matter? It, it matters for behavioral reasons, right? Because we're all human beings, okay? And no matter how much you tell yourself, you know, I'm, I, I can withstand the volatility, it doesn't matter, I'm going to keep investing for the long term, inevitably what happens is you're going to take a drawdown that is so severe that you are going to question the long-term thesis. Just for example, yes. like let's say, you know, um, I, look, go back to 2008, right? Go back to 2008. Stock market goes down 57%. Well, 
you know, a few years earlier, Jeremy Siegel had written a book called Stocks for the Long Run, right? And which ended up being true. But in 2008, nobody was saying stocks for the long run. They're like, they're like stocks are dead forever, you know? So what happens is, is that price changes and moods changes and sentiment changes and emotion takes over. So like you, that's why I say when you construct a portfolio, you have to construct it in such a way that it minimizes that volatility. Otherwise, you're going to get shaken out. Absolutely. One of the... Um... One of the things someone's asking about is you mentioned college as your top three. However, I don't think that will be relevant five to 10 years from now. Do you have any thoughts on that? Um, this is a changing thing. I think we were talking about college in terms of you <laughs> and your experience, but this is really relevant right now, especially with AI coming at us. I have kids that are just at the point of beginning that journey. So w w this is top of mind for me, for sure. I don't know, investing in college now, Jared, um, hard to say, right? But any thoughts on whether that should be a priority for people? Uh, I'm a big proponent of higher education. I'm getting a degree right now. I'm going to be finishing up soon. Um, What's your, just, what, remind me again, fine arts? Are you doing a fine arts degree? Yeah, I am. Yeah. Amazing. So, um, you know, you mentioned AI. I don't think that's the end of college. And by the way, you know, about four years ago, there was this big short higher education thesis and that didn't work out. Um, I, I think, you know, you're seeing a contraction. First of all, demographics are getting less favorable. They're, they're, you know, the generation is, the generations are getting a little bit smaller. So college, you know, college enrollment is going to go down. There's going to be some colleges that go out of business, but, you know, still like, I don't think, I don't think this changes the equation at all. It, like, most people are going to have to go to college and they have to figure out a way to pay for it, right? And the problem with student loan debt is in two, we did a couple of things. So in 2009, we nationalized it. We said, okay, the government is going to do all the student lending, okay? So second of all, um, I lost my train of thought. Um, uh, you do believe in higher education. But one of the things I was thinking about as you were talking about this is debt. So like maybe the answer is college is still fine, but if you have to go into so much debt to do it, then you need to think about again. It's kind of like the car. Yeah, decision. I mean, like unless, what kind of education is worth getting if you know, so that you don't stress yourself out, where you'll get the revenue benefit but not get the stress from the debt. If you go to an Ivy League school, uh, MIT, Chicago, Stanford, something like that, if you go into a top ten or twenty school, it doesn't really matter what it costs. You should go for a whole bunch of reasons, right? Like. It's not just about the education that you're going to get. It's about the connections you're going to make while you're there. If you go to Harvard, the unemployment rate coming out of Harvard is like 0.01%. Like you're going to have a job. So it's, and you're going to be able to service that debt. For any other school, let's say for the mid tier of schools, so state schools, you know, second tier liberal arts schools, stuff like that. What I like to say is that you should have less than $40,000 in debt coming out of those schools. And if you have $40,000 in student loan debt, you can pay that off in five years. So if you get a job coming out of college, making $60,000, $70,000 a year, you can pay $8,000 a year in, of your student loans, and you can be debt-free in five years. What what people do is is they go to these third tier law schools that cost two hundred thousand dollars. Then they they're making forty thousand dollars as a lawyer. And by the way, another thing that happened in two thousand nine was that we have the income based repayment plans, right? So if you have a lower income, your payment is lower, but you're not paying the interest. So the interest is added to the balance of the loan. It's a huge mess. So forty yeah. in most cases, forty thousand dollars is the most debt you can have. Yeah. Someone's saying the US system is messed up. And they're also mentioning you can get a lot of opportunities online. That's all true. Again, this is a this is a kind of personal situation, right? And and life experience matters. There's all kinds of, I think you're gonna see a lot more co-ops where you do half internships, half college courses. Um, there's all, you know, again, this is a potentially a good disruptive moment, right? Higher for higher ed to be disrupted, but you know, maybe something you would still want to think of about investing in. We're almost out of time. I just want to say, wow, such a great conversation. So many good, great comments from all of you. Um, I just appreciate the quality of this conversation. Jared, as we kind of close out, um, any parting thoughts? I mean, I will tell you, I am walking away with a really 
I love the idea of sort of taking the guilt and shame cycle out of this and just thinking about it in terms of stress level and what's manageable, which might be different from everyone. Um, and then st proactive steps you can take, just having the agency to figure out what's right for you and kind of concentrating on the big stuff and not getting caught up in some of the small crap. That for me is su super helpful. But any thoughts you want to leave everyone with? Yeah, I mean, the goal isn't to have the most money. The goal is to be happy, right? The goal is to be happy. So, uh, and there's a pretty weak correlation between having money and being happy. So if if getting to a level of income or wealth is going to put you in a position where you're going to have to do a lot of things that are going to make you unhappy or stress you out, then you should probably rethink doing it. So remember, the two sources of financial stress are debt and risk. And I'm not saying you should completely avoid debt or risk because debt or risk are inevitable, but you should try to minimize it and manage it as much as possible. Amazing. Uh, Jared, thank you so much. This is an amazing conversation. Someone said everyone in Real Vision is a grinder and you are right. You're hardworking and you're a total learning tribe and we love you for that. We're going to stay on. We're going to wrap this session. We're going to be back after a short break and we're going to dive into a little bit more of the mental process around all of this with Denise Schull. If you haven't met her yet, you're going to want to um, join us back after the break. Jared, thank you so much. Thank you. We hope you enjoyed the video. At Real Vision, we help you understand the complex world of finance, business, and the global economy with in-depth analysis from real experts. Join the revolution at realvision.com.